Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And before I get to our guest here today, I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoy this content, to please give a like and subscribe down below. I'd greatly appreciate it. We have Christina Wilson on the podcast. She's a bodybuilder coming to us all the way from Florida. But most importantly, she's our current guest. Christina, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So what really inspired and what really motivated you to get into shape and really, you know, turn into a bodybuilder and get in this type of condition? So, um, basically I've been active my entire life. I started dancing when I was three. Um, and then I started running and I was always an active kid. I was always a tomboy. And then around the age of 15, I was starting to go down, um, a rough path because I didn't have good guidance at home. And a teacher kind of saw me and saw the potential in me, Mr. Tasso, his name was, I'll never forget him. And he threw me into the gym. And all we did was we did bench, we did shoulder press, deadlift, and squat. That's all we did. And every once in a while, bicep curl, because he liked to show off a little bit. <laughs> um, and he really taught me the basics, but he, he built this foundation within me to appreciate an active lifestyle. And it really kept me out of trouble. And then after that, I found marathon running. I blew out my knee. I got really, really depressed. I didn't know like where to go. I had three surgeries. And then my friend brought me to Mr. Um, to the Universe competition in Teaneck, New Jersey, and this this aura was just circulating within that that energy of competing, and I just absolutely fell in love. And I was um, 23 years old, and now I'm 31, and I I can't picture my life without it. It's it's very similar mindset to running, where you can you you can have teammates and you can work out together, but at the end of the day, if you don't follow your diet, if you don't um you know if you don't train by yourself, you're not going to be able to get to that finish line. You're not going to be able to get to that stage. So I was able to relate to that same mindset. And it was just an easy transition to go from running races to being a bodybuilder. That's awesome. But I got to ask, I mean, marathon running, that just seems like suicidal to me. Like I look at these, some of these marathon runners and I'm like, why the hell would you want to run that long? And I hadn't, you know, I had an ex-girlfriend that did half marathons and marathons. She'd be like, oh, you want to go out on a run with me? And hell no. Of course I don't want to go out on a run with you. It's like, it's like, are you kidding me? It's like, why would I want to do something like, I mean, that's like, I, for, I mean, I'm one of those people where, I mean, I'm also six, three. So running for me, I mean, that's a little bit harder for the longer legs where it's just, it's just a little bit more of a struggle for me. So yeah, I, I look at marathon running, but what really inspired you to get into marathon running then, as opposed to, I mean, you started working out, but then what made you say, Hey, you know, I want to run 26 miles. That seems like something that sounds like fun. <laughs> well, there is a freedom within running that you just lace up your shoes and it doesn't cost you anything. It just other than your soul. Yeah. <laughs> well, it depends on if it's hot out or not. But, um, but I literally would just lace up my sneakers and sometimes I wouldn't even need music. And by the time I knew it, I was running 12, 13, 14 miles and I, I didn't even think about it. It was just such a liberating escape for me. And at the time when I started running, I was really going through a really rough time trying to find myself, trying to find my confidence, who I was. I was at that age where my, my mindset was so tumultuous and I was all over the place and I was dealing with a lot of uh, childhood scars and teenage scars that I really, I, I felt as if running was a full escape. I could just get away from everyone and everything. And it was freeing for me. And it was very debilitating when the doctors after the third surgery were like, you're done. And I was like, what, what do you mean I'm done? I, I, I don't understand what you mean. So to have that freedom taken away and now be incarcerated in this cast and this, uh, you know, all of my freedom taken away from me from what it felt like, I just didn't know where to go. And I started drinking again. I started, you know, doing things that definitely weren't who I was anymore. And my friend saw it and was like, we're going to a bodybuilding show. And I was like, why would I want to watch men in, you know, thongs basically on stage and flexing? I'll go to Chippendales for that. <laughs> and when I went to universe, it was just such a beautiful art to watch. And I, I just, and this was really before Instagram took charge of, of bodybuilding. I think it was, it was more of like that mindset. It was still kind of the night of the champions error. 
you know, so I think there was a little bit more art and beauty to it um, prior. I think the industry has really metamorphosized a little bit since then, but I just fell in love with it. And it really has taught me a lot about myself, my confidence, my dedication. You know, uh, it really has liberated so many, much anxieties that I had that I feel like it's such a, a beautiful way to express yourself. It's more than just lifting weights. I think people just look at us and think, oh, she's just a weightlifter. She's just a bodybuilder. Or what I get every day. Do you do CrossFit? No, I don't do CrossFit. <laughs> but I, I feel as if there's, there's so much more to bodybuilding that can be offered to the world that from what I've experienced, that it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. I mean, that's why I love having bodybuilders on the show, because so many times there is that misconception that, you know, all they are, like you said, they're just weightlifters where people don't realize they're just, an, they're just a normal person deep down, just like everyone else. Where I mean, yeah, they might have a hell of a lot more dedication than you have when it comes to certain things and they may practice a different lifestyle. But deep down, you know, they're just normal people who just enjoy going to the gym and enjoy working out. But you did mention Chippendale. So I do have to say my senior year of high school, we had a thing at our high school called the man pageant where it was kind of like a beauty pageant where it was like a, it was it was like it was sort of making fun of like beauty pageants where they like the guys did like performances and they did like funny skits or whatever. And then they tried to win like uh, our high high school's like man of the year is what it was called so far my skit or i helped a friend out i wasn't competing so one of my friends was on and he was a very heavy set man so we decided to do the chris farley chippendales snl skit as as, oh. as our skit that we did where i i played patrick swayze and he was chris farley yeah and we and we, it was it was a lot of fun and we absolutely and it, this was like at night and there was like 500 people in the audience like a lot of the senior class came out and a lot of you know the parents came out so yeah it was interesting to see, and it was interesting for my parents to see their son basically dry humping the air in the Chippendales and the Chippendales get. So yeah, that was that was you know it was it was a lot of fun. But I always love to say also, just going into the gym, a lot of people don't realize if you were to walk into a gym with a hundred people, there's a hundred different ways as to how those people got into shape. Whether it comes down to their diet, their nutrition, how many reps they do, what exercises they do, so many little things add up to the overall package that people end up seeing that I don't think people realize. And I always say if you were to walk up to someone and say, hey, what did you do for this body part? It looks amazing. What works best for you? 99% of the time might not work as good for them. Yep. 100%. 100%. And I, I think there's this misconception too, when it comes to bodybuilders that we just live in the gym. I think that you, there has to be a healthy balance and we all go through those stages in our lives where we're a hundred percent in the gym all the time, but then there's a maturity that comes with it. And at, with age and with competing and getting more into the sport, you learn that there's a healthy balance between rest and, you know, an uh, quote unquote off season and enjoying social norms. Because don't forget when we are in prep mode, like I am now, like I don't really have a social life. I do live in the gym because I can pair it to someone who's going in college, right? A lot of people don't understand that. Like, why would you, I get asked all the time, why do you sacrifice? Why do you do this? Why do you diet so hard? Because people go to college. What do they do? They're doing homework all the time. They're studying. They're, they're putting their efforts into their goal, their dream. And I'm doing the same thing, but there's a certain physicality that comes with mine that is going to be more noticeable than someone going to college or going for a promotion at work and this, that, and the third. When I'm in my off season, I have a healthy balance. I lift four days a week. I, you know, I, still do my cardio. I still eat right. But you know, two days out of the week, I'll go and hang out with my friends or go to a baby shower, things like that a normal person does. Because once you mature and get through, you know, off season, on season and compete and live the lifestyle, you realize how important balance is and how important it is to fight the social thought that we're just lunkheads that are in the gym all the time. <laughs> No, you're going to hate me when I say this. I only studied probably about a dozen times in college. I was one of those people where I didn't, but here's the thing though. I took probably the easiest classes ever. Cause I just wanted that piece of paper, but still, you know, I, yeah, all my friends hated me. They're like, you don't even study. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. They're always like, Oh, you didn't even study or anything like that. And I was like, yeah, cause I wasn't an idiot. I knew that you just need a piece of paper to get the jobs basically <laughs> that you wanted. But yeah, so they, I give them, I give them a hard time about that. But I also love to ask probably one of the, my favorite questions to ask because everyone's genetics are differently. Everyone has that one body part when they get started in the gym that really, really takes off that they don't need to train as much. And then everyone always has that one body part that, I mean, they just have to kick it into drive just to get it to catch up with everything else. I'll give you my example. So my back, I mean, I had jobs all throughout college too, where I was like, you know, like loading trucks, you know, lifting, you know, up to like 150 pound packages and loading them into trucks. So, I mean, you either had a, you either developed a really good back or you quit. That's basically like the two, <laughs> the, the two scenarios that ended up. 
So, and, but also being six, three, I mean, my legs are just shot where, I mean, I have to train them twice a week. And I, I believe me, I've had plenty of people come up and they, they assume that I've never trained legs a day in my life. And I have to tell them like, it's like, no, believe me, I train legs. It's just, you know, they're, they're harder for me to grow. But what were those body parts for you when you were getting started? So legs have always been my weapon on stage. Um, most girls, <laughs> I just rubbed it in a little bit. <laughs> I didn't mean to be pernicious. That wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't my intention. <laughs> um, but I've been able to develop legs very easily. I think part of it was because I was a runner for so long. Um, they get conditioned really easily, but also I train them very, very specifically. So um, I do tut training and it really has taken off for me. Um, but my back is my Achilles tendon. My hands, I'm going to put them to the screen, are super tiny for a normal person. <laughs> so for me to grab a weight and pull down is extremely taxing. And a lot of times, I don't know if you see my my forearms, my forearms. I'm not trying to show off. Forearms are forearms. jacked. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, and it's not because I train them. It's because my hands are so tiny. I have to grip really hard. Mm -hmm. So my back has been my sore spot. So I took off two years after I competed in USA's and I said, I'm going to make my back and be a sun stage. And that's what we're going for this, this prep. I mean, it's been six years that I've been trying to build my back for, and it's just been very arduous, but it, it really taught me that if I set a goal for myself, I'm really going to be able to, to hit the nail on the head. So I understand your frustrations with your legs because that's my back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, you already showed, can you give us a front double bicep already? I mean, it, it, her arms are basically popping out of the camp. Look at that. Just hold that for a second. Look at that, everyone. I mean, it's like, that's absolutely ridiculous. So yeah, yeah, at, yeah. And the forearms are basically just as big as her arms, but I always, I get that too, because lifting all those packages, I mean, your, your forearms, I mean, that's basically, and I always hate, they always have these little packages that are about that big that end up being like 40 pounds. So then when you, when you try to pick them up, they're just awkward. Yeah. yeah, they're awkward. But I got to ask, how do you, do you, are you able to do like pull-ups or anything like that then with those small hands or when you grip the bar or is that the struggle? Not easy at all. I have to use wrist straps for everything. And like, I have the capacity to be able to lift heavy. I did mm -hmm. powerlifting for a little bit. I've squatted 525 before, oh, I've, <laughs> but I couldn't deadlift because my hands were too tiny. <laughs> it's impossible. So I really just decided to not train so heavy because I was always told, Oh, heavy will make you big. Heavy will make you dense. Blah, 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 blah. It's really been mind muscle connection. So I go, I actually go pretty light, but I hold it. I squeeze it. And with pull-ups, I just use the, the, the straps because I, I can't, I literally will do five or six of them before my hands are like, yep. <laughs> No, if you do the two finger pull ups, I mean that's basically you know I, I've had some people that try that and I'm just like good good god you're at, you're absolutely crazy. But are there any specific types of working out that you like to do? Because I mean, so many people they talk about you know like time under tension or other methods. Is there a certain method that you follow, or do you just sort of like to try everything? It's definitely tut training. It's definitely time under tension. I enjoy intensity. I don't really like lifting heavy. I feel like I've done it. I'm capable of it, but it hurts my joints. Like and with my diabetes, it makes my sugar kind of like all over the place. Um, so I really just focus on intensity. I love training supersets. I love drop sets, but my, my absolute favorite is time under tension. Cause I feel like it pushes you beyond here. Um, and it makes you humble yourself with the weight. Um, so I usually do negatives, like for instance, on a leg press, I'll do a three, two, one, and then I'll push up with a lot of intensity. And then, you know, when I feel like I'm really starting to get exhausted, I'll push out really quickly four to five reps and just annihilate myself. And that's really how I've been able to bring in my conditioning, my size, get blood in the muscle. I mean, I get sore a lot faster, keeps up my metabolism. So no matter if I'm training in off season or on season, that's how I train no matter what. You explained it a little bit, but just for the viewer out there that might not be really into weightlifting, what exactly is time under tension? And I know you kind of elaborated on a little bit, but what exactly is it and how, how is it used? So there's a couple different structures when it comes to time under tension and it's called cut training. So there's the negatives like a leg press where as you're coming down from the, from the negative of the action. So you're coming down in the leg press, you go three, two, three one, and then push up with force. You're not going to use as much weight. So it's healthier on your joints. And it really pushes blood right into that muscle. There's also time under tension where you're contracting the muscle. So let's say you do a pull down, for instance, you're, you pull down and you hold three, two, one, then release back up nice and slow. So <clears throat> there's a couple different forms of doing it. Um, I enjoy the negative aspect of it. Um, the first one that I described, 
but there's the other way is definitely beneficial as well. And I feel like it saves a lot of joints and it, it really enhances the metabolism at the same time. Yeah. I used to do time on attention when I was getting in really good shape, you know, in college, but now that I have a job and do all this, you know, I, I go to the gym still a, a, a decent amount of time, but I still, you know, practice time under tension at times. But I got to ask, I mean, being diabetic, did you have any concerns about, you know, going on a prep and just realizing that you are going to be like restricting yourself and you are going to be super, super lean Did that, did you have to, you know, convince yourself sort of to do that because being a diabetic, were you worried at all? Um, I, I'm not so worried about the diabetic part. My more concern was, so I have something called Cushing syndrome. I was born with it. And as you age, it progresses. So one of the side effects, unfortunately, is getting diabetes because my body doesn't really understand how to regulate its hormones. When I was younger, they thought because I was active that that's why I was having some of the complications that coincide with it. They misdiagnosed me a bunch of times. It wasn't until I was 27, uh, let's see, 27. Yeah. 27 that I was officially diagnosed with it. Um, I was on diabetic meds before during preps, but I wasn't ever insulin dependent until this prep. So back in 2017, when I went to USA's, um, I couldn't catch my sugar. No matter what I did, I was just not able. My sugars was in the 300s and I couldn't figure out why. Um, after that, they gave me insulin um, to control my, my sugars. So now I'm being insulin dependent. I feel like I'm more cognizant of my health. Um, I'm being coached by a gentleman named Johnny Castellana, who's out of New Jersey, who's absolutely phenomenal. Not only is he prepping Miss Olympia at the moment, but he is really aware and very intuitive with my condition. And that's the reason why I hired him. Um, and he, we pushed actually back my show a couple times and I, what I'm not upset about it because my health comes first. And that's what I think a lot of people forget during preps is they get so engrossed with the process and pushing themselves to outside of the norms where they're doing two or three hours cardio. Well, there's a reason why your body isn't responding. It's a health aspect. So for me, I'd rather push back my show and be humble and take my ego out of it and have longevity in the sport and being able to diet properly with my diabetes. If Even if you're a diabetic or not a diabetic, you should really take your health more into consideration as you're prepping because that's how you're going to look healthy on stage. That's how you're going to win shows and have longevity to compete back to back to back to back. So uh, what we're doing right now is we're keeping carbs in my system, but we're just doing in, in total, by the time I step on stage, it'll be a 22 week diet. Does it suck a little bit? Do I miss brownies? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I got a sweet tooth. I miss me some brownies. But at the end of the day, my, I'm going to come in healthy. I'm going to have longevity in this. My my sugars aren't going to affect, you know, the rest of my body. I'm not going to be demonstrative of my goals in the long run. So I really feel like I don't have trepidation going into a prep for diabetes. My Cushing's, I think, with the cortisol issues that I have, with the hormone issues I have, may set me back. But we just got to figure it out. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. I'll just go. There's always another show. So I just took my ego out of this and really focused on being healthy over anything. And that's so important because like you said, I think so many competitors, they don't realize that, you know, some of these effects that they do right now on their body. I mean, yeah, they might not really happen within the next year or so, but, you know, five to 10 years down the line. I mean, you really do got to think of your health. And I think with bodybuilding, that's a sport where you especially really have to have that thought process. But I always were to say, if you were to pull the general public, I mean, 95% of people would not be willing to be able to get into shape enough to be able to go on a prep because you just you need to have that before prep body just to be able to go on a prep you need to have that balance and that structure but going on a prep i mean you are notching things up to an extreme where your diet has to be perfect i mean you have to get all of your workouts in you're basically become like a mad scientist where you're just you know mixing all the right concoctions where it comes to your your your, your, your meals and your workout plans what was that adjustment like for you i mean going into that such very scientific sort of anal lifestyle where i mean everything has to be perfect um I was actually looking forward to it because it's been two, by the time I step on stage, it'll be almost exactly two years since I stepped on stage. So for me, I view it as like a luxury. Bodybuilding is expensive, let's face it. <laughs> so I had to mentally, financially, emotionally be able to put myself, okay, I'm ready for this. So in my mindset, like I don't view it as 
really a sacrifice where prior preps I did. And I was, you know, going through that torn feeling of, oh my God, I want to eat. Oh my God, this is torture. Oh my God, I'm doing all this cardio, blah, 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 blah. Where now as I've matured and now I know how much of a luxury this to be able to do this actually is and how gifted I am to be able to do this. Um, I don't really view it as sacrificing or having to prep my mindset. Are there days where I struggle with the diet? Absolutely. When you're, when you deprive yourself as much as we have to, you're going to go through those stages where you're of deprivation. And we question, we always question ourselves during our goals and we always second guess ourselves. Why do we do this? But at the end of the day, if you have emotional connection to whatever goal set you are, whether it's bodybuilding, whether it's a career aspect, whether it's family aspect, what, whatever you want to have and uphold, if you have a strong emotional connection to it, you're not going to view it as a sacrifice or deprivation for the long term. You're going to view it as, OK, these are the steps that I have to take to get to where I want to be and where I know I'm capable of being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And that just adds even more to like the general public just doesn't realize what you guys go through when it when you go on prep. So that's why I love to ask, you know, prep questions, because I mean, for me, it's just so fascinating. And just how that those extremes that people that people go to when it comes to their diet and they're working out. But I mean, it does show the end product really does show. But one of the things that I love to talk about, because it's not talked about, I don't think at all when it comes to Instagram and it really should be because it is the best thing when it comes to recovery is sleep. I always say, you know, I had the number one sleep specialist on the planet call on. He was from the UK and he was calling us from Oxford. And first of all, he had one of those British accents where you just felt like you gained 10 IQ points just from talking to him <laughs> where I, I honestly told before the podcast, I was like, I'm just going to hit record and you're just going to talk the entire time. I'm not going to say a word. You just ramble on for like 45 minutes and we'll be good. But yeah, he was, he was unbelievable. And just talking about how important that is. And also the fact that we are similar and that you work nights too. And I work nights as well. I mean, I usually get off around like midnight or one and then I'm not in bed and asleep until like three or four. It's very hard to go to sleep when the sun's about to come up or to just have that nocturnal schedule. How are some ways that you're able to offset that and still be able to do the bodybuilding lifestyle when I mean, you have to have the energy to go to the gym and a lot of it is so much such a mental focus aspect. How do you, how are you able to function? So because I'm in prep and because of the Cushing's, not only do I have to get seven hours of sleep, like it's not negotiable. I also have to train twice before I go to work like yourself. Like we don't have a normal schedule where we can do our cardio, then go to work and then work out at night. Like it, we don't have that option. So in by the time I wake up to the time that I go to work is only about six hours. So in that time frame, I have to work out twice. I have to prep my food. I have to make sure I have to be regimented with my schedule or else I'm completely thrown off. So to be able to sleep, um, and I know I have to sleep because I have that, that pressure from work. I, I, I started using this product called Redcon or the brand is Redcon called Fade Out. And that really helped me. Also, I try to be able to shut off my phone, shut off like anything. I play my game for a little bit on my phone and then I literally like turn it off and then I force myself to sleep because I know and like yourself, if I were to just give myself freedom, I'd be up till five or six o'clock in the morning. I know that I need that rest and I know I have that pressure where I have to work out twice before I go to work. And so if you don't sleep, I'll tell any competitor, even like the normal person that's just trying to lose weight. If you do not sleep, your body cannot recover. You burn so many calories sleeping. And when you don't stress out your body, this is the only time where your body's not stressed out is when you're resting. So if you're just like a normal person trying to lose weight and you're, you're going through the trudges of this stressful job, and then you come home with stressful kids and you know, you're trying to get everything done and rush around the house and you never have time to go shut off mode. You're not going to lose that weight because your body is not, is, is going into instinctual. I'm going to save everything because I'm in panic mode. And that cortisol level is really, really high. So when you get to, a six, seven, eight hour sleep range, you're going to lose weight like that. Like I remember Johnny was like, you need to take a nap. And I was like, why do I need to take a nap? He's like, trust me, take a two hour nap. I literally woke up dry as hell. And I lost like a pound or two mm -hmm. just from sleeping. 
it it really is just so fascinating to see. And I always say, editing these podcasts, I normally have my laptop, you know, on the desk right here, and then I have my bed right behind me. And sometimes at night, I always just hear like a little voice in my head saying, like, edit, edit those podcasts, get it done. So yeah, it's hard. Yeah, I completely understand. You know, you really need to have everything shut off just to be able to get that sleep. But I always say too, kind of adding on to what you were saying one of the best feelings in the entire world is after you've had a long, heavy, like long, hard workout and you're just feeling so tired and you get that proper amount of sleep the next morning. I mean, that's one of the best feelings in the world is waking up. You feel like a superhero basically. I mean, and that's, I mean, that is up there with, you know, some of the best feelings that you can ever feel. But I also love to say, cause the number one biggest stereotype that I love to bust on this podcast, it's gotten better the last five years with Instagram, but there's still a significant amount of women that have that fear where if they go to the gym and touch one weight, they're just going to hulk out and put on 50 pounds of muscle muscle overnight. And I always say to that, you know, you'd be the first ever trillionaire. Everybody and their brother would want to buy what you were selling. But did you ever have that fear when you were getting started? And even if you didn't, I bet you hear that all the time now. How do you like to respond to that? Well, I believe the social norm has really swung from where it was. Uh, Growing up for me, all I saw was Victoria's Secret models, Kate Moss, you know, all these real thin girls. And that was what was pretty. That's what was permeating into my head constantly that I needed to be skinny. So uh, when I was younger, even during my running days, I'd have severe eating disorder. And, you know, when my father was around, he, it was so, it was so important for him to instill in my mindset, you need to be skinny, you need to be skinny. Now, girls are growing up with Instagram and a different social norm where curvy is in, you know, these bodies that are hourglass, these big booties and, you know, like big legs, that's what's in. So it's not really a a heaviness factor as in girls are trying to get fat, but to create those, those tones, these girls wants these shapes, these curves where maybe you're not genetically blessed with them weight is going to do that for you. So I feel like there's actually an opportunity and an openness now to people where it wasn't before there was just, it was these cardio bunnies. It was kickboxing classes. It was cardio, cardio, cardio. Whereas now to create these shapes that people are envious of, I can say, Hey, look at my before picture when I was running. Right. And not really doing much weight, maybe training twice a week where now I'm weight training five to six times a week in my, you know, my heaviest times. And I've created these curves. I've created maybe you don't want the muscle density that I have, but you're not going to get that overnight. You're going to get that through a specific kind of training, through a certain kind of eating. I've been I've been lifting for 15. 16 years at this point, you're not going to get that overnight just from lifting a few weights. So by your technique, you're going to be able to create these curves that you see every day on Instagram and these social pressures that you're getting, where now I feel like there's an opportunity to create these not muscular women, but muscularly more enhanced women. When I always say, if you are able to do it overnight, though, give me a call. More than happy to talk to you and pick and pick and pick your brain. Yeah, more than more than happy to do it. And I always tell the story of when I was in college and you know getting bigger and stronger. One of my really good friends, she came up to me and she said, "You know, Ryan, I can see all these changes that you're making. I want to go to the gym with you, but I'm just afraid that I'm going to get too bulky." And I told her, I said, "Look, the amount of weight that you carry in your purse when we go out to clubs or when we go out to get something to eat weighs more than ninety percent of the dumbbells in the gym." She had a very heavy purse. I mean, it was like twenty five pounds on a on a good day. So I don't know what she had in that thing, but it sort of really convinced her to just go to the gym and just you know, give it a shot. But I always say too, this is the number one thing that I think impacts women so much more than it does guys positively from working out. It's the confidence boost that you get. I mean, we see some guys where they walk into the gym and they're like 300 pounds and they act like they own the place. And first of all, give me that confidence. First of all, I mean, I sign up. So yeah, yeah. They walk in basically, they have invisible lat syndrome where they think that they're, yeah, they're they, they think that they're, they think that they're huge and there's walking up and yeah, I, I, and I used to be, I used to do that as a joke, like in high school, but yeah, it, we all know those type of guys, but especially for women, just that confidence boost that you can get from working out. I always say, that is the probably the biggest thing that you can transfer from your healthy and fit lifestyle into every single aspect of your life. How has that confidence boost from working out really impacted your overall life? I think the power that's and the freedom that's behind being able to shape yourself and the and creating your own piece of artwork is very empowering. Like I felt at, when I was running, while there was a freedom in it and it's such a a a lovely feeling of self-worth, but when I was alone. Now I go out in the public and I stand straight. I have a certain confidence to me that exudes because I've created something that not many people 
have the ability to be able to do. And that's not me talking down against anyone else. It's me fighting social norms. It's me creating a diversity and a uniqueness within myself that I breed confidence in. Literally, I can go to the gym without a stitch of makeup on. I can go in the crummiest clothing. I can walk outside and not feel ashamed. Whereas prior, I was dressing up all the time. Like I have makeup on now and whatnot, but I'm I'm presenting myself right now. But on an everyday basis, I have a confidence that only bodybuilding could give me because I've made myself unique. I've created something from hard work, from hours and hours. I mean, literally countless yes. times in the gym. And I did it myself. So there's a certain pride that I take in knowing that I did this. No one gave this to me. I didn't, and no offense to anyone who gets implants or anything like that. Like if that's your body and I'm not saying anything negatory against it, but I decided that my own ideal for body for me, me personally, not anyone else is to look the way that I am now. And I don't feel like I need to en enhance myself in any other fashion fashion in a fake way where muscles have been able to give me such curve and dimension more so in my personality. I mean, there's things that have come out within me that I didn't know existed because bodybuilding brought that forth. It brought me, Hey, if I can dedicate myself five days a week or six days a week, whatever, two hours a day, I can do anything I put my mind to because I'm not only living a certain lifestyle, I'm creating an awe factor to people where, Oh my God, what is she? And don't get me wrong. You get stupid comments constantly, but it's more because people don't understand it. I feel like fear in itself is an imaginary state. It is based on two things. It is based on self-confidence issues and not wanting to change. So you know, people who don't understand my body or who look at it and think negatively about me, they just don't understand it or they have their own self-confidence issues. So for me to be able to present myself to the public and say, you know, I'm strong inside and out. I created this. There is nothing more gratifying and, pr and, and prideful and not egotistical, but self there's a certain self-worth that comes with bodybuilding and not the industry, the sport in itself that brings forth this just positivity and this luscious energy that I, I want to give to everyone. <laughs> I want to be able to give to everyone what I've experienced. And I want to ask, you know, was it hard for you to decide not to do implants? Because for anyone who isn't followed bodybuilding, I mean, I always say if you're a plastic surgeon, you could just make all your money by just going to bodybuilding shows. And I mean, it's, it's so, so common. Was that a struggle or was that internal at all? Just deciding whether or not to have them? Because I mean, they're so popular when it comes to female bodybuilding. Um, not in the least bit. Yep. Not, there's not one day, like, are there days where I look at a shirt, like, oh, I'd love to fill that out. Um, I'm actually very small chested. But I have no pressure whatsoever. At the end of the day, I'm an athlete. I am. I've cr I've literally created legs. I've created a booty. I've created shoulders. I've created all these things. If God didn't want me to have them, then I'm okay with that because I built up every other part of my body that I that I could make. <laughs> I can't make them. So while there's women where I'm like, wow, that looks beautiful on them. That you know their their boob job looks great. I myself, I'm an athlete at the end of the day, and I'm. I'm okay with it because I, I have pecs and you know what, if someone doesn't, if someone wants to judge me for looking manly, cause I don't have a chest, that's not like, I get, like I said, that's again on them, not me because I feel beautiful the way that I am. A absolutely. And that's a good one. I'm going to use that from now on where if someone complains to me like, Oh, I wish I was tall. Like you all just say, God didn't want you to be tall. Yeah. We all have road bumps that we have or blessings that we have. Like I, I would love to be tall because you can reach things that I can't. But, but then I have a step stool, you yep. know, like you, <laughs> there's, there's always other outlets that you can. And for me, like, I just, I, I felt it when I was skinny, but now that I have this confidence that bodybuilding gave me, like, I know that I'm beautiful and that I'm feminine and that just because I have muscle doesn't masculate me. Yeah. No, yeah, I believe me. Being tall is really cool, but I have a job too at my job where some of the poles that I walk into are, are six feet tall. So about once a week, I, bu I bu 
excuse me, about once a week, I probably get a concussion. I mean, I've probably been concussed because I'm, I'm, I'm walking really hard. So I'm known, you know, I'm known as the guy, you know, that bumps his head every once in a while and everyone goes, Oh, what's wrong? He goes, Ryan just bumps his head. So I'll just be on the ground for about 10 seconds and then get back up and I'll have like a big shiner right there. But yeah, that's, so that's one of the things that tallness really, you know, you got to work with, but I always love to say too, the biggest myth that I never believed until I got on this podcast and started, I don't think the general public would ever understand is that for a lot of these competitors, posing is the hardest thing for them. It's harder than you're working out. It's harder than your nutrition. I like to say now, you know, you can be a great driver. You can never be a perfect driver. That also goes with posing. You can be a great poser. You can never be a perfect poser. It's always ever evolving. What has your experience with, with posing been like? So I have zero stage fright. I've been on stage. Like I said, I, I was, uh, like I mentioned to you before, I was a dancer since I was young. So like getting on stage does not bother me at all. Um, I have, I, I like to present at the end of the day. I've worked so hard to be able to do this. And for me to half-ass the posing doesn't make any sense. I think people don't take it seriously. So posing is an art in itself. And I and because I was an expediter for a long time for the NPC, I know how, how really super important it is to have good posing. Because I've seen girls who had amazing legs, but because of the way they posed, they didn't show them off the way they, they could have. Or if they had a horrible body part, they could have hidden it a little bit more with their posing. So posing in itself can really um, emulate your confidence, but at the same time, it can hide certain areas that you're not a big fan of. Like with my back, like I know that my back is kind of, uh, so I know that I, certain poses that I do um, are going to highlight my uhness. So I got, I got to make sure that, you know, my, my other poses are like magnifique because I have to make sure to offset that. So posing in itself, especially transitions, there's a certain elegance and opulence that you need to be able to show and present because I know girls who show the lack of confidence in their face, their, their posing could be on point, but because they look down all the time or they're like not making eye contact with the judges or, you know, they're, they're not smiling. Like these are things that are going to show on stage and affect your, your end all score. And why are you going to sprint and work your ass off to get to the finish line? And then at the finish line, you fall flat because you're not showcasing all your hard work. So I, I really feel like people need to work on their posing in their off season, in their on season and humble yourself. Go find a posing coach. I don't care how good you think you are. I make up all of my routines, but at the end of the day, I still hire a posing coach because they're going to be able to see things like, oh yeah, you've improved in this aspect and I, your back is really improved. But I feel like if we just tweak this a little bit, you'll be able to show it even better. Remember your eyes see something different than other people are going to say right? We're, we're always our hardest critics and we could feel, or it could be the opposite side of the spectrum. You feel like you look great and you really look like crap when you're posing. <laughs> no. Yeah. I always say too, like you were talking about, you could be the most muscular person on the planet. If you don't know how to pose, you know, good luck with that. But also I just, people just don't realize too that, I mean, it's a workout in and of itself going through posing classes. I mean, we've had competitors come on and say that, you know, like the next day they've never been as sore as they are then, but what is your favorite pose to do? And what's your least favorite pose to do? I hate the ab thigh. Oh yeah. my God. I, pose. I despise it so, so much. I don't know why they have it to me. It's like, it's, it's a pointless pose in my opinion. I personally love on my, uh, for my physique in particular, my side try, I think it's my, my strongest or my, my side chest. Um, also I think there's a certain, certain elegance to it. Mm -hmm. for women to show off their muscularity, but also their femininity at yep. the same time. So I think, especially with women's physique, like women's physique to me is like my end all be all. I'm so happy that they opened up this field. And I just think it's, it's such a beautiful thing. Like with classic physique now for men, I think it's a beautiful way to showcase your muscle. So definitely ab and thigh. I wish they would take that out. Um, but for me, it's my side poses that, because I, I mainly because I feel like the angles and the, the elegance to them. If for physique, is that where they do the closed fist or the open fist for front double by? Do they do open fist? 
Oh, open, open fist. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, because that, I, that sometimes I see that and I was like, first of all, I was like, that's, that's just, that just seems like it's so hard to do. And then, yeah, that's, that was just a conundrum for me to deal with. But yeah, posing, I mean, the ab and thighs, that's the number one thing that we hear all the time where people are just like, why do we have to, it just looks so awkward and it looks so weird. And I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more, but now a question that I ask all of my guests, whether they be, you know, health and fitness or my bands for my bands, I always ask, you know, what is that feeling like performing on stage and, you know, just being live in front of hundreds of thousands of people, but that also applies to the bodybuilders that I have on the show. What is that feeling like for you when you get to go on stage and show off all of that hard work that you've worked months upon months for? It's freeing. <laughs> it's a moment of like, right before I get up on stage, it's a moment of gratitude. I say my prayers. I'm a, I'm a fa very faithful person. So for me getting into my headspace, I'm, like I said, I, I don't have trepidation about getting up on stage. I don't, I don't get stage fright. A lot of people really have a fear of the stage and being in front of people. For me, it's an opportunity to showcase my work and also have fun with it. We should be having fun. <laughs> like this is with all the hard work that we do. So many people do not have fun when they get up on stage. Um, my routines are fun. When I'm on stage, I look like I'm having fun. Even if it's more in the serious poses, I have a smile because it's genuine, genuine gratitude. It's genuine happiness. So I think what people need to do is take that fear out of it and be like, okay, you're nothing's going to happen. You, really like you're taking this way too seriously. You, you work so hard, go and enjoy yourself. <laughs> but, but really I take a moment and I just, I, I, I thank God. And I, and I really praise my dedication levels and we're here we're gonna we're gonna kill it it's all positive thinking it's not oh my god if I don't place I didn't do enough cardio I don't I take all the negativity out of it because that's only going to stress out your body which is going to make you hold water and all the bad effects of it but it also is going to take away from that moment that you've worked so hard for so it's nothing but positive thinking because and I, I don't judge other women either. I'm not backstage and I'm like, oh my God, she looks like this. Oh my God, she looks like that. Like a lot of people will take off their robes and try to, you know, peacock themselves around where, you know, they're trying to show off in front of other people. That's, that's you, whatever you want to do. Um, I don't look at other women. I just focus on what's about to happen and I'm about to have fun with it. And that's such a great attitude to have because so many people, I think if you aren't, if you really just try to calm yourself down, I mean, you're going to do so much better on the stage, but now one of the fun questions, what post-show meal are you looking forward to the most? Currently it changes like every week. <laughs> so I never eat cereal. I've, I haven't eaten it as a kid. I've never, ever, ever liked cereal. I don't like milk. All of a sudden I'm craving cereal. And I, I don't know why. <laughs> so now all I think about is I was in Walmart the other day and they have new strawberry Pop-Tart cereal. And I'm like, oh, my God, what is that consistency? What does that taste like? That, that, that's all I can pick up. But normally what it is, is it has to do with peanut butter. That's that's basically what it is. Any kind of peanut butter is like my go to. So I saw your face. You probably like it, too. Right. Oh yeah. That's my bane though. Because like when I started working, I added peanut butter jelly sandwich every day. And then I started gaining a little bit of weight and I was like, what's that come from? And then I looked at peanut butter and I looked at the stats. and I was like, Oh, cause I have like the jiffy peanut butter, like the, like the fat peanut butter. So I was like, Oh, that's where it's coming from. So yeah, peanut butter too. Yeah. I always said if I ever competed, I would just rent out a five guys with like a thousand dollars and just be like, here's what's going to happen. You're going to feed me until I either die, throw up or pass out. But either way, I'm just getting my money's worth. So this prep, I don't really food porn mm -hmm. because I find like it's, it was distracting from prior preps. Like I would get so engulfed in like looking at food all the time that I wasn't being productive in my real life. And I, my cravings were just, I, I'd be more tempted to cheat. So I really don't look at food porn the way I used to. And that's completely abnormal for me. But my, my last prep, I food porn, my last two preps ago, I food porn so much that Broad Street Donut sent me a box of donuts on the house. <laughs> To my hotel room to where I was staying, gave me four customized donuts. And Bruno Brothers, too, in, in New Jersey, they gave me money off my meal because I, I food poured them so much. So shout out to Broad Street and Bruno's because you guys freaking rock. That That is so awesome. And one of the questions that I love to ask because, again, it's not really talked about too much. And it's one of the biggest things that a lot of people that come up to me and say, you know, like, Ryan, I love watching your podcast. But a lot of people don't realize that that stage look is not sustainable. You're not going to be able to stay that lean. So many people just don't realize that where they look at these photos and they think, you know, like, hey, these 
these people are these people you know they they work their butt off to look like that they must be able to maintain that look but it's not possible to look like that year round what was that like when you first realized that you know like hey all this hard work that i put into it this is the best that i'm going to look for a while and i am going to have to put on weight was that a struggle at all i think in the beginning when i first started competing there was this need so i mean my cravings were so bad when i first started because i was really depriving myself a little too much um that i just ate and ate and ate i didn't i didn't know the balance of it yet i i think first time competitors when they're they're really just beginning in this sport we don't understand we're not, we don't have that maturity level yet to be able to find that balance so while we want to keep that lean physique that need to fulfill ourselves, our hunger and our exhaustion, I think just really takes over. So there's this battle of, okay, I'm going to eat, I'm going to binge eat on nasty food. And then I'm going to starve myself the rest of the day because I want to look lean. And you know, you go back and forth and back and forth. But now that there's a maturity in me doing this, and I, I think most competitors who have been doing it a long time, we know how to balance it better. We'll have our cheat meal, but we know what we need to eat and when we need to eat it. And we realize that that stage look isn't healthy. You know, you can't, you can't go four or 5% body fat and be able to function in your job, be able to have a normal lifestyle and be able to have a date or, you know, go out with friends. Not that I'm saying go party all the time, but there's not a normalcy within it. Um, and some people have the metabolism where you look at them and they're shredded year round and then they have, they have a really hard time gaining muscle and you have other people like myself who gain muscle like that, but it's really hard for us to stay lean or get lean. So I find that with competitors, as they've been doing it for a certain amount of time, that maturity and that instinct really kicks in where we're not going to those extremes. Cause let's face it, anything to an extreme is bad. Whether you're too lean, you, you have too many fat soluble vitamins, whether you eat too much fast food, you know, no matter what extreme that you go to, anything to the abnormal range is unhealthy. I don't care who says so. If you don't rest enough, if you eat too much, if you stay too lean, it's just not going to be ideal for your body. And when you have that maturity, you want you want longevity in the sport. We all want to be IFBB pros that last 10, 20 years, like Dexter Jackson, like some of these people who compete for a long time. They understand the balance that it takes. So they know that they can't stay year round because it's just not healthy. And I always say too, it's just like starting a business where you got to spend money to make money. You got to put on weight if you want to put on muscle. I mean, that is just so important. But two of my favorite questions that I love to ask all of our health and fitness guests. So, I mean, there are so many positives for me when I started going to the gym in college really seriously and, you know, taking it up a notch. But one of the negative things is that you're going to get asked to move a lot of people's furniture. You're going to get asked to open a lot of pickle jars. I mean, I'm still at home with my parents for the next couple of months before I move out. And every single time they come home with groceries, they basically have to lift the car into the driveway and carrying the groceries. Has that been a similar experience with you where, where people just take a look at you and they just assume that you can do stuff for them? Well, they know I can't open the pickle jars because my hands are too tight. So I got out of that one. Um, I think I don't get asked those kind of questions as much of the annoying I get the, the two questions that annoy me the most is, do you work out? Actually three. Do you work out? Mm -hmm. yeah. Clearly. Yeah. <laughs> no, the muscles come with the shirt. <laughs> um, uh, do you do CrossFit? Yep. Because people just don't understand like bodybuilding versus CrossFit's mm -hmm. very in style right now. Yeah. So they think I do CrossFit. Mm -hmm. And the third one is, can I touch you? Yep. Or they just touch you. I don't touch me. It's like touching a pregnant woman. Like you mm -hmm. just don't do it. So yep. I, I don't get really asked like, to do the moving thing or anything like that. Um, but I, I do get asked those three questions and I think that it's just, people just don't understand at the end of the day. I, I can, I cannot tell you enough times that when I was in college and I was in a lot better shape than I am now, I mean, just going sleeveless, I would have girls just come up and start feeling my arms without even asking. They just be like, Oh, Hey, yeah, like, for God, that's good. Oh, no, no, that. no. Be honest. No, I was being, I was being, <laughs> honest. I would pump it up a little bit for him. And I, you know, I was vain back then, but you know, yeah, it's just, and you get asked to arm wrestle all the time too. I mean, that's another thing too, that I, that I really found for me, but also I always say you were talking about, you know, it's nice about being tall, but the only negative for that too, is it's a double-edged sword because if I had zero muscle, 
also at all, I'd still get asked to do stuff because, oh yeah, tall guy can do it. You know, tall guy reach up there and get that. So, you know, it's one thing that I definitely had to get used to, but my favorite question that I'll ask you is, I mean, again, everyone, this is a multi-million dollar idea for anyone out there listening, but when it comes to clothes for fit women, I always say fit guys have their own problems. See, we get that reaction every single time. I always say, you know, like if you have big, broad shoulders, dresses aren't your best friend. Jeans are another thing that we hear of all the time, where if you have a big lower body and a small waist, jeans are not built for that. But what have been some ways that you found that you're able to compensate for the fact that your clothing options can be very limited? Um, luckily I live in Florida, so I can wear sleeveless all the time. <laughs> Another reason I moved to Florida. Um, I wear, I, I find that if you find a good tailor, it makes, you don't have to, um, have a lot of clothes. You just have a lot, have to have a lot of well-fitting clothes. It, my aspirations are to become two things an IFBB pro and a motivational speaker. So I know I have to present myself a certain way. Um, and having a good tailor, Totally respect that. And any bodybuilder, you need to find yourself an awesome Haitian or or Latin woman to be able to do your clothes cheap and get it right. Yep. <laughs> um, uh, but it is, I, I wish that society, while it, like I spoke about before, it's changed from that skinny norm to the more curvy norm, which is better for us because we can find a little bit more clothes. I wish they would have tailored to an athletic form. Let me, let me just give you an example. I, I subscribed today, actually today, prior to doing this, um, an in-style styler who sends clothes to your house because I just, A, I don't have time to shop and B, I get way too frustrated. They never asked once for an athletic body type. They asked like literally 50 questions on this questionnaire, but never once was there any, they asked curvy, straight, pear-shaped, apple-shaped, all these different shapes but they never once mentioned athletic. So for me, it was frustrating because, okay, how am I supposed to subscribe to something where you don't even have athletic options? There are many, many people, especially you can see it on Instagram that are starting to become more fit, become um, more intuitive with a healthy lifestyle. Why don't they have options? It just doesn't. And I've been asked, well, why don't you start a, a clothing line? Well, I can't draw a stick figure. How am I supposed to design clothing? Like I, I can't do that. So like if there's someone who's watching that can design it for athletic women, I promise you, you're going to make so much money. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I cannot agree enough and anyone out there just get on it. But now we go to the questionnaire part of our podcast. We're going to ask Christina about a half dozen health and fitness related questions that we ask all of our guests. So for our first question, out of all of your followers that you have on Instagram, what would be one thing that you think they would be surprised to find out about you if they met you in person? If they, oh, that's a good question. Um, well, everyone knows I'm a car geek and a foodie. Um, I'm actually very much a loner. <laughs> I, I, I like my alone time. I, th I think people would be surprised by that because I'm, I'm very socially ept, but I, I would prefer to spend time with my dogs or like do something by myself. <laughs> oh yeah. No. Yeah. I, I totally understand that. But now what is one item that you always need to have in your fridge? Uh, peanut butter. <laughs> yep i was gonna say that our most famous answer has been mustard that's get that gets answered about 10 times but that oh cute yeah we have our dog interruption what's the dog's name we can see the other one in the background too what are their names that's colossus and meatballs in the back he's Meat chilling he's oh, older he's like 12 but colossus is like my shadow mm -hmm. he's he's four years old and he's your typical pit bull that just needs attention all oh, the time oh yeah yeah we have a little cabochon at our house it's about a little like nine pound dog but yeah that thing thinks it's the toughest thing in the world until you get to within a foot of her and then she rolls over and she knows her, her bark is you know a thousand times worse than her bite so yeah I, I i totally understand that but going on in the questionnaire if someone were to come up to you and say you know christina we made a decision that you know you could change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding and everyone would go along with it what would be one thing that you would like to see changed um make the sport and the industry mesh again, where it's not industry is all ego and sexual connotations and sponsorships yep. based on how much ass you show, make sure give respect to the sport and show the people who don't know the sport intimately. Like we do a certain sensitivity and a certain love and passion that the old bodybuilding had before social media. Uh, I couldn't agree more how it's become, you know, a little bit more sexualized and you look at that and you're like, Oh my God. Like, it's like, they're just, they should just be showing off their, the muscle and stuff like that. Yeah. There's girls who will literally be like, Oh, I just worked out my bicep. Literally they show their female parts. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't, I don't understand it. Like, and it gives, I, I, this is such a hard topic for me and mm -hmm. I'm so 
uber passionate about this one subject matter because women amplify themselves on the uh, on social media in such a disgusting way that it gives other people this connotation that bodybuilding is uh, is only sex mm -hmm. i'm sorry and it's so much more beautiful and substantial in people's lives like myself that i feel ashamed by the industry not by the sport do not get them i am not ashamed by the sport i absolutely love bodybuilding true fact but the industry has just taken away the je ne sais quoi of it I, I cannot tell you how many times, like, even when I'm messaging people to come on the podcast, that they're surprised. They're like, I get so many weird messages from people and, and all that type oh. of stuff where it's like, and, and, and yeah, I, I know that's a whole topic in and of itself where that shocked me too, where I was like, oh my God. And some of them like shared like screenshots and stuff. And I was like, okay, yeah, I would just, I wouldn't even be on Instagram. I'd just be like, okay, deleting this. I'm done. Yeah. I could go back and forth on this subject. <laughs> I know. I know. That's going to that's gonna be a whole podcast in and of itself with someone where I'm just going to say, we're just going to talk about the weird stuff that you get. But yeah, that's one thing too. I mean, that thing I think has also come along with that where people see these photos and then they think that it's sort of like permission to then be an asshole and you know ask for weird shit when it comes to when it comes to that yeah so yeah it's it's absolutely ridiculous but now moving on in the questionnaire we'll go to a little bit of a lighter topic so what is your what everyone has one what is a guilty pleasure movie that you enjoy so um here's the funny thing i don't have the attention span to really watch tv that's the god's honest truth i have such a hard time sitting down honestly um, I'll play my, I, I, I play a tile game, like maybe 10, 15 minutes before I go to sleep. But for me to actually sit down and watch a movie, I'm always doing laundry dishes, something to keep my, my self going because I get so antsy. So, I I wouldn't, I, I really don't think I have one just because I can't really sit down. <laughs> hey, hey, being someone that has severe ADD too, like myself, you know, I, I totally understand that where, yeah, you just, you, sometimes you just can't really sit down and concentrate. But if you were able to go back in time and talk to the 18 year old version of yourself, what would be the best piece of advice you would give her? Don't base your beauty on what others people want from you. Mm -hmm. I think that was... That was such a battle that I had at that time um, that I really was searching for approval from everyone because I didn't approve of myself. I didn't really know myself back then. So I would really just generate your own strengths and be grateful for your weaknesses because you're going to be able, if you're humble about it, you can understand that beauty resides within yourself and, and what you can really present to the world. I, I was so naive about what beauty was that it really hindered any type of progression in my life. I, I had such anxiety about going out into the world in general. It, it would take me three hours to get ready. Um, I was covering up with band-aids, quote unquote, emotional, emotional uh, holes that I have by presenting myself to please others instead of to please me. I'm more comfortable now, you know, being a tomboy, knowing myself that I'm fine with people exiting out of my life because they don't approve of bodybuilding because they don't approve of my athleticism or anything like that. I didn't have that confidence back then. I didn't know who I was. So really what I would tell any young girl growing up and even my, my past self, once you find out who you are, it's liberating. And that in itself is beauty. It's not what, how many likes you get on Instagram. It's not what other people, are those people paying your bills? Are those people, you know, um, in your life, do you know them? No, you have no idea. They're strangers. Don't base your self-confidence off people that you're never going to see again. I couldn't agree with you more on that. Yeah, it's it's definitely one thing that I tell myself too, where it's like you're not going to be able to please everyone. I was a big people pleaser back then. But if we were to talk to a year from today, where would you like to be at, you know, in just your overall life and your bodybuilding career? Where would you like to be at if we were to talk a year from today? I want to say in 15 weeks, I'll have my pro card at Pittsburgh. Um, and then from there, I'd like to do motivational speaking. That is That is definitely the trials and tribulations that I've had in my life or why the reason why I'm nicknamed the Titan. So I'd really like to be able to present that to the world and say, Hey, I've become an IFBB pro and really lead. I, I really want to be a significant part in leading the industry and bodybuilding into cohabitating again in such a positive manner. So like truly from the bottom of my heart, I love this sport so much that once I get my pro card, not if, but once I get my pro card, I want to be able to show 
anyone, whether you're, a, you know, you're a troubled kid or you're an overweight adult, no matter what the spectrum is, that putting yourself into a dedicated place and knowing your worth is really going to be the catalyst to achieving your goals and having this positive mindset and faith and foundation in something that in a year from now, I'm going to say I have my pro card and I'm, I'm going to be in front of people speaking motivationally. And I got to say, if she looks that way now and in 15 weeks, I mean, I can't imagine what she's going to look like. So yeah, ev- everyone go and give her a follow. I'll leave a link to her Instagram and everything down below. But for our two final questions, I got to say, if someone were to walk up to you on the street and say, you know, I, you look amazing. I want to get into shape too. And I want to really, you know, get started. What's your best piece of advice for someone just to be able to take that first step into the gym? Cause for so many people just taking that first step is the hardest thing for them. Um, ooh, that's a really juicy question. I like that one. I would say, don't look at anyone else. Don't compare yourself. Because, you know, you don't know what they're going through. You don't know how long they've been training. You don't know any, it, it ask questions because you're inquisitive about your own progress, but don't keep looking in the mirror. Don't take a bunch of pictures. Don't get sidelined by all these distractions because don't get it because momentary pleasures or momentarily moments of lack of confidence are what is going to deter you. Get to your goal. And even if it's long term, don't give in to the momentary stri- strifes of us feeling anxieties or self confidence issues or anything like that. I definitely say don't allow the distractions to get to you. Just focus on yourself, and that's it. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. And so many people they just try to compare themselves to others, and like we were talking about before, genetic wise you're not going to be able to look like most people. Let's be honest. You're going to have to be able to look your own way. So I couldn't agree with that more. And now lastly, is there anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to before we wrap things up? So definitely one person would be Johnny Castellana. Um, He's out of Jersey guys. And he's just, I have to say as a, as a person, as a coach, he's really been able to uh, amplify my confidence in knowing that there's people in the industry who care. Coaching wise, he's a really intelligent man. So anyone that's looking for coaching, if you have any health issues or, you know, or anyone who just needs a transformation, I definitely recommend him as a coach. Um, I want to give a shout out to Ray Ragnacci. Um, he's been there for me through everything. He's been really the first guy in my life who supported me and really wants me to achieve my dream. So I, I really want to say thank you to him. And also, <clears throat> To anyone who's stuck by me, um, as I go through, you know, my my swings and prep, I tend to, like I said before, become a loner. So people who understand me and don't get frustrated by me kind of taking a step back out of their lives, I really do appreciate you. Um, and finally, the people on social media who respect me um, and who value my words and not just my body. Most of my followers, a lot of my followers are people who actually know me in person. And I'm very grateful for that because people who know me in person really respect me and know that I'm not about the bot. It's not all about the body. It's really about here and here too. So, um, to them as well, I, I really just, and thank you to you for having me on the show. Like I really appreciate it. And so thank you for reaching out to me. No worries. And in a way, because it's a tool where we can meet fantastic people with like mindedness. So thank you to you too. Shout out to you. No. Yeah. I, I can't say, you know, how grateful I am, you know, to have this platform where I can talk to people and, you know, have them share their stories. Cause like you said, and people just realize that, you know, they're all, they're not just bodybuilders, you know, they're, they're normal people. I mean, we've had doctors, nurses, you know, every type of profession really on this podcast, lawyers, you know, it's, they're not just bodybuilders. It's something that, you know, that they do that makes them really feel good. And I mean, obviously the results show, but again, you guys, Christina Wilson, we cannot thank you enough for being on the show. Everyone go and give her a follow. I'll leave a link to all of her stuff down below. I highly, highly recommend it. And we wish you nothing but the best of luck in your competition. I honestly think that you're going to do great. And again, you guys, this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot signing out. Have a great day, everyone.